the policy committees last Friday, right now the uh, Ways and Means Corporations and the CAP and the Institutions Committee are all dealing with their crossover differences from uh, So some of our committee members are necessarily involved in those committees to try to work on some other pieces. Uh, so there may be some members who are not in the room for a follow-up this morning or maybe any of this morning because they've been deputized to other tasks. Not a, it's not an indication of lack of interest on their part. So what, I'd like, what, we're, what I want to do, what we decided to do this morning, is to try to give our committee um, <coughs> both some background and an update on the call payer model, which is an important piece of healthcare uh, reform and healthcare uh, changes in Vermont. And some of this will be familiar to numbers of you and for others it'll maybe be the first time that it's really been laid out in a, how did we get from where we were to where we are now. Uh, and I think it's important for all of us to understand that and then we'll also have an opportunity to get some update from uh, the Green Mountain Care Board about their work with the old payer model as well as the but What I'd like to do is to invite Ina Bacchus to join us first as the Director of Healthcare Reform from the Agency of Human Services. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Ina you know, brings uh, a great deal of background and experience with the all payer model from her work over the past number of years, and she can share some of that, I'm sure, in the course of this as well. So, uh, good morning, Ina, and welcome. Um, so, let me just say, if I may, that I think I'd like to hear from give Ina the chance to give us some um, information. And then uh, I thought I would turn to Susan Barron. Susan Barron, okay. Uh, and have the Green Mountain Care Board uh, follow up. And then to Alicia. Uh, and we're going to try to do this between now and 11. I think we can <coughs> likely can do that. But, there, but I'm also, uh, I think what would be useful is to have a give Dean a chance to present and then have then take some questions and then have Susan present and then take some questions and then do the same. So if committee members to the degree that we can hold questions between each presenter, I think that would be useful, but we'll we'll manage it. If, there, if there's questions that really need to get asked in order to understand what's happening, uh, we'll communicate that and we'll all we'll work together to make sure things get understood. So with that, uh, Ina, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ina Backus. I am the Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services. Thank you for asking for us to provide, or for me to provide, this history and context today about the all-payer accountable care organization model agreement. I understand that the committee wanted to uh, look at the background and um, the, the lead up to the agreement that we now have with the federal government. <coughs> it's important to start with what Vermont's payment and delivery system reform goals are. We have a primary goal and a cost containment objective to move away from fee-for-service reimbursement to a population-based payment model or a global budget model. And very wise people would describe this differently than I would as someone who is steeped uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, vernacular, if you will, of health policy speak. Other people would say this is like paying our current system fee-for-service, which is the predominant reimbursement model, is like paying for time and materials versus if you're trying to build a house paying for the getting a bid for the total project and having that budget set up front. That's a way to look at the difference between fee-for-service paying for each and every service that's delivered in the healthcare system versus paying for what you think is the best estimate of the cost that the providers need to deliver healthcare services in a flexible, high-quality way. That being said, we are looking to employ a re reimbursement model that directs payments for quality and outcomes. Whereas a fee-for-service model may pay for what would be 
characterized as wasteful health care spending or duplicative health care spending, a reimbursement model that provides for a, a budget and is linked to uh, health and quality outcomes, then requires that the health care system is performing at its best and that uh, the services being delivered are delivering better outcomes for Vermonters. Can I pose a question that I, I should have frankly posed earlier for you? Uh, but what what is it that brought this to Vermont's attention? As this is this is an initiative we should engage with. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just going to, in the broad sense, and I, I mean, everyone recognizes or there, there's often reference to like we there was there was a time when we were going to look at universal publicly financed health care mm -hmm. and then that was really moved forward for a period of years as a uh, the, the intent and the hope and the plan and then that that was determined to not be feasible to move forward with and then in some period something something in the interim after that stopped then I think some people are like, and now we're doing all payer model. And how do we get from one to the other? Is that anything you can help us with? I can help with that. that, that I think because I think that that transition is a piece of what's uh, confounding for some people. I think it's a transition. It appears as a transition, but is not in fact a transition. It was a concurrent <laughs> effort on behalf. That's important, maybe of the legislature and the state of Vermont, recognizing that how you pay for health care and how you how you collect the money are two different things. The the work to provide for a universal, uh, publicly funded health care system is about how you collect that money. The work of the all payer model is about how you pay for health care, meaning you pay for services in a fixed prospective payment rather than for each and every service as it is delivered. And that's a key <laughs> distinction. When the, when the legislature enacted Act 48 in 2011, and we'll talk about that as we work through the history and context, it recognized that the health care spending in the system was not sustainable. And that spending and the way to get that spending under control was to look at how we could pay differently. The, the notion of collecting the money and providing for a, a universal healthcare system of some kind was not in isolation from the need and the recognition that there had to be key cost containment initiatives so that the state could afford, if we were to arrive at it, that universal publicly funded system. So there were there were simultaneous uh, initiatives. Yes. And from a, given that I was in judiciary world at the time, <laughs> to be honest, I wasn't chairing this committee, um, I think maybe in the public view, the universal publicly financed system kind of took all the attention, uh, or a great deal of attention, and I think there may have been less awareness that there was a simultaneous piece of looking at, I mean, we certainly were hearing about the need to contain costs and that this, there was some level of initiative that was already underway That's right. at that time and then this has, what we're talking about today is the continuation of that initiative yes. even in the absence of the decision, or in the, even having made the decision that we were not going to pursue the publicly financed universal health care yes. at the time. Act 48 set those two pieces in motion at the same time. I think that's important to understand. Yes. Uh, in, uh, in Vermont's goals for payment and delivery system reform, we also appreciate that we need to create incentives to coordinate services across the care continuum and to pr improve care <coughs> and well-being for Vermonters. And fee-for-service, not only does it, does it and can it um, induce unnecessary utilization, it also creates a fragmented healthcare delivery system because there aren't incentives 
in the reimbursement model for providers to coordinate with each other. If they don't coordinate with each other and persons need more services, they're paid for those services. Um, there's also not necessarily time in the reimbursement model. The reimbursement model is reimbursing providers for uh, every service that they're billing. There's, there's no code that you can bill for calling another provider on the phone and coordinating care. For collaboration or coordination. That's right. So those are the, the, the key obje objectives and part of Vermont's payment and delivery system reform goals. And to achieve those goals, we have arrived at um, the all-payer accountable care organization model agreement as a way to see, and, and, and we are, um, we have this agreement with the federal government, it's a five-year agreement. We are through the agreement, we have and we will continue to shift from reimbursement to prospective payment and to see if that allows us to achieve our goals. At a very high level, what that looks like is in the state of Vermont, there's an accountable care organization, One Care Vermont, which if you've heard from already, you should hear from again. Well, if we're going to hear, I just, this is giving me the opportunity to say, it, so to be clear, that we've invited One Care to, they're going to be presenting to this committee next, uh, early next week, I think, yeah, early next week. And so we wanted to have this presentation first so that there was a broader understanding and then we're going to be hearing from one care much more specifically in depth uh, early next week. So I will leave it at a high level that One Care Vermont is an accountable care organization and the federal government recognizes accountable care organizations as groups of providers, an integrated network of provider that the federal government is willing to provide for an alternative payment. Medicare will pay an accountable care organ organization in a prospective way. And, and in Vermont, we have a single accountable care organization. And at this time, the accountable care organization model agreement expects, and this is what is happening, for there to be <laughs> consistent contracts between the major participating payer groups, that's Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers, and the accountable care organization. And the agreement expects that those contracts shift risk to the accountable care organization by providing a alternative payment. So One Care Vermont, the accountable care organization in our state is receiving alternative payments from these three groups of participating payer types. And is it this agreement, is it this agreement that actually allows that to happen? It allows that to happen for Medicare. I mean, and that's a key piece. Yes, it? yes. Those, part of the agreement is premised on the notion that for providers to change how they're delivering care, the incentives need to be as aligned as possible. And the agreement asks, and Susan Barrett and others from the Green Mountain Care Board can talk about this more. The agreement asks that the state is looking to see how the payment models are aligning in these major payer contracts. Does that include, for the sake of coordinated care and so forth, working towards alignment of things like um, Pre-authorization, so that <coughs> doctors are not like having to look which insurance. I remember a description at one time that part of the concept was a patient coming in to a doctor. From the provider's point of view, it was payer agnostic. Mm -hmm. The provider wouldn't have to sort out who's your payer and what does that mean, mm -hmm. and that that was what was really fundamental to um, being able to have that coordination of care. To what degree is that a part of it? That is certainly something, and I'll let the Green Mountain Care Board speak to how it uh, analyzes and provides for its assessment of alignment across payers, but that's certainly an area that I think it would be assessing to see what that looks like in terms of the participating payers. So it is part of the goals of how it would function ultimately? Yes. I don't know if we skipped over this, but maybe, or maybe you're going to come back to it. In terms of 
who the agreement, who are the parties to the agreement with the federal government? Does that? The, the, the state of Vermont has an agreement with the federal government, and that agreement provides for many, many, many things. Uh, but the, the important part in, in what we're talking about here is that that agreement provides for the Green Mountain Care Board to set the Medicare rate of growth for the ACO. So it provides for some, while well, Medicare is paying ACOs in this alternative way through its own programs, the Medicare program in Vermont is customized and the state of Vermont has, has a lever there in establishing the rate of growth for the Medicare program. The agreement provides for many other things in addition and I will, um, I will touch the wave tops of those things and the Green Mountain Care Board will go more into depth. So what does the all-payer all, all ACO agreement provide for Vermont? In, a, in addition to the flexibility that we have as the state in how we uh, provide an alternative payment model and guide that for Medicare, we, um, we have in, in turn have to achieve reasonable rates of growth. And those rates of growth have to be rates of growth that are uh, amenable for the Medicare program and then also rates of growth that we as a state think are appropriate for the healthcare system as this is a cost containment effort. So we negotiated a lot with the federal government about what those reasonable rates would be. So we have reasonable target, targets across all payers for limiting health care <coughs> cost growth. And those targets are assumed that they can be met because of the alternative payment model that this agreement sets up. The, and this is the agreement between the state and the federal government. Medicare has a participation agreement that is separate with the ACO, and that's where the actual, when you hear the term all payer waiver, it's a little, that's where the actual waivers are flowing between Medicare directly and the accountable care organization. And then the accountable care organization also has contracts with Medicaid and with commercial payers. But the agreement between the state and the federal government creates reasonable targets for limiting health care cost growth, and that's for Vermont residents. It creates meaning, meaningful measures uh, and targets to support population health improvement. And the Green Mountain Care Board will go over with you what those targets are and how they're measuring. Protection of Medicare beneficiaries, meaning that Medicare beneficiaries in this model maintain all of the same uh, protections that they have that they would have in a fee-for-service model. Nothing changes whatsoever for Medicare beneficiaries. There are enhanced benefits for Medicare beneficiaries. So there, it, there, are, there is the um, access to some additional benefits for those who are attributed to ACOs, but no benefits are disrupted in any way. This model and our agreement with the federal government allows us to preserve some successful Vermont health care reform programs. Specifically, this model allows for funding to remain in the state of Vermont, Medicare dollars, to support the Blueprint for Health and the SASH program. Prior to this model, the Blueprint and the SASH program were being funded through Medicare by the Advanced Primary Care Practice Demonstration. That was a Medicare <coughs> demonstration program that Medicare sun sunset, they finished and we're no longer going to be providing funding from Medicare for those types of programs. We negotiated with the federal government for funding for those programs to remain in our base, so to speak, so that we could continue to fund them. And just as an aside for the committee as well, on the list of presentations that we haven't had yet is from the Blueprint for Health. So we've been trying to simultaneously deal with a number of policy issues and laying if you will, the foundation for all the different significant initiatives and the blueprint is one of the pieces which we will want to have a presentation about in more depth, or initially. In Certainly, yes. Depth. So. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with that? 
watch this. I'm waiting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot that you're taking. I, I, I'm trying to see how to balance all this. There's a, there's a lot here. We can we can go. I'm I'm flexible. However, don't I don't mind if you want to interject, but I'll let you. Uh, I'm trying to along the way ask some clarifying questions. That I think just help to try to. I talked about the Vermont specific local control in this model, meaning that the Green Mountain Care Board is setting the benchmark spending, that's the per member, per month spending for the Medicare uh, beneficiaries that are attributed to the Accountable Care Organization, and it's also setting the rate of growth for that spending. So each performance year of the model, the Green Mountain Care Board sets the rate of growth, how fast Medicare will grow, and that is very specifically local control. Medicare has a program of alternative payment models for accountable care organizations. Medicare sets the benchmark and the rate of growth. It does it for those programs. They have no, there's no state control of that in, in the rest of the Medicare program. This is also provider-led reform, meaning that there, there's flexibility of dollars um, the dollars are flowing in a different way. The accountable care organization is a network of providers, and that network of providers is working together to determine how to work in this new payment model to deliver health care services differently and to improve the well-being of Vermonters. In addition to that, as we negotiated this agreement, we simultaneously had stakeholder conversations with health care providers in Vermont about how um, we would operate in this alternative payment model. So provider-led reform means those two things at once. And what we heard from consistently during those stakeholder conversations, and as we go through the timeline, you'll see how long uh, we were, how long ago it was we were having those conversations um, and that we continue to, we heard from providers that it was very difficult to approach payment reform with, um, with with their foot in two different canoes, meaning that if they were in a payment reform project where the payment was only changing for, from one payer or from part of their <coughs> patient panel, then it was an expensive and difficult proposition to think about changing care delivery for some but not all. And that's a really important part of why we have scale targets in this model to include uh, preponderance of Vermont residents and also why the model looks to be consistent across all major payer groups. That was uh, something we heard from providers um, very, very early on when we were working through the, and I say we, when I was at the Green Mountain Care Board, we were working through Not everyone knows that you worked at the, Green Mountain. the charge of Act 48 to develop payment reform pilot projects. That was something we heard from providers. This model includes a six-year phased-in approach to implementation. We're now in the first quarter of performance year two. It was very important for us to have a lead-in time because of the significant changes that the model would require. So in 2017 was actually performance year zero, meaning that we were preparing and the providers were preparing then for payment change. Uh, the, State and the federal government have an agreement that there are no financial penalties to the state or providers if the targets in the agreement aren't realized. It doesn't mean we'll be successful if we want to continue in an agreement. With. If, if we don't perform under the agreement, the appetite to have a next agreement might be, uh, might be uh, curtailed. And there is a substantial accountability for this model via the oversight of the Green Mountain Care Board. And that is both through the agreement itself and everything that is prescribed in the agreement in terms of what the Green Mountain Care Board needs to monitor and report on. And it's also through the legislature in Act 113 where it requires the Green Mountain Care Board to review the budgets and to certify accountable care organizations operating in Vermont. So, that, that is where we are today. How did we get here? The background. Like I said, we, we spent quite a bit of time negotiating with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. 
The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was created by the Affordable Care Act. It was created specifically to test alternative payment models for federal for the federal government. I say that because it's very important for us to see that while Vermont is we're very much at, we're very much leading in this area, but the federal government is also pushing in a variety of ways. It's pushing <coughs> states towards what it calls value-based payments. Um, it's pushing states to pay in their health care systems for quality and outcomes rather than fee for service. In 2016, like I just mentioned, um, the legislature it granted authority to enter into the eight all payer model agreement if we were consistent in in and with the principles outlined in Act 48. And also that is where the requirement for ACO certification and budget review. Uh, was created for the Green Mountain Care Board to engage in those activities. And in 2016, the governor, the secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board all signed the all-payer accountable care organization model agreement with the federal government at, in October of 2016. Stepping back even further, as I said, the Affordable Care Act created the um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. It uh, looked at how states could test innovative payment and service delivery models to reduce program expenditures, and it specifically uh, named accountable care organizations as one of those models. I talked about uh, this already to a degree that uh, Act 48 created the Green Mountain Care Board and empowered it to look at um, alternative payment deliver and, and delivery models for controlling the rate of health care costs. So we've gone over this a little bit as some of the context for how we arrived at the agreement that we have today. In 2013, the federal government awarded states with state innovation model grant funding. And Vermont was one of the first cohorts of states that was awarded this funding. And this funding was specifically for testing alternative payment models with an emphasis on multi-payer payment reforms. In 2013, the Green Mountain Care Board created a multi-payer accountable care organization shared savings program. The Shared Savings Program was Medicare's first ACO program <coughs> where uh, providers would be um, held accountable for quality and performance in, in the healthcare system, but where uh, the savings, if there were savings, would be shared between payer and provider, and the risk was not shifting uh, from, this is called one-sided risk, the risk was not shifting from payers to providers. I think it's really important that when uh, this opportunity arrived for Vermont and we had the funding of the SIM grant, that we, Vermont, felt that it was important to, to test this model, the shared savings model, on a multi-payer, all-payer basis. So the Medicare program had the model that it was running, Vermont participated in that, and then Vermont through a provider and a state stakeholder process arrived at a Medicaid and a, and a commercial program. So that was a first, that was our first multi-payer effort. The shared savings program, very importantly, didn't change the fee for underlying fee-for-service reimbursement model. It did not provide for upfront dollars for healthcare providers to in a more flexible way, and it did not shift the risk for that spending onto providers. In 2015, the federal government developed the Next Generation ACO program, so it looked at what was happening with the Shared Savings Program, and it wanted to develop a way to, to shift more risk. Um, it provided for a uh, payment model that offered monthly per beneficiary per month payments to ACOs. 
and it permitted ACOs to accept higher levels of financial risk. Also in 2015, Congress enacted the Medicare Access and Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, known as MACRA. This is a piece of bipartisan le legislation. It repealed the flawed sustainable growth rate for Medicare and said, okay, we tried to contain Medicare costs through the sustainable growth rate formula. It hasn't worked. We're going to repeal it. And the focus of MACRA was to look at that Medicare cost growth and to uh, uh, seek to contain it through, through value-based payment models. MACRA is very clear in moving Medicare towards paying for value for outcomes and quality. In 2015, the legislature enacted uh, Act 54, which uh, uh, allowed for the state to pursue an all-payer uh, model. In 2016, the Green Mountain Care Board and the uh, then administration presented a, a term sheet for the all-payer model proposal to the federal government, uh, to the legislature, and that term sheet detailed all of what Vermont wanted to see in the agreement. I will say that after, um, after we had a draft agreement, we crosswalked the term sheet with the draft agreement, and there were some key areas where Vermont's proposal to the federal government had changed based on our negotiations, and that um, was, was a very interesting way to capture how much um, our negotiations with the federal government influenced what had been our initial proposal. And um, largely some things that came into that um, I think are really good parts of the agreement in terms of ensuring that um, Medicaid beneficiaries maintain all of their access to services and that there is an effort to understand what the differential is in payment between Medicaid as a payer and other payers participating in this all-payer model. Um, like I said, Act 113 was also passed in 2016. I think responsive to the, the information that the legislature was hearing about this all-payer model agreement. And as I said, it provided for uh, substantial oversight responsibilities for the Green Mountain Care Board. And again, in 2016, we signed the agreement. And here um, I list what the agreement provides for, which I've largely explained to you in the previous slide. But there it's detailed. Um, as I said, 2017 represented year zero of our agreement, not a performance year for which Vermont was being, uh, Vermont's progress was being tracked with our federal uh, partners. However, in 2017, the Department of Vermont Health Access launched its alternative <laughs> payment model contract with OneCare Vermont. So Medicaid launched its program a year prior to the launch of the all-payer contract. And Alicia will be here to talk to you in detail about that Medicaid program. And in 2017, the Green Mountain Care Board anticipating the start of performance year one, which was 2018, successfully completed the process of uh, evaluating One Care Vermont's budget for its all-payer program and for setting the Medicare rate of growth for the accountable care organization participating in the model. And then again in 2018, the Green Mountain Care Board went through that process with One Care Vermont of evaluating its budget and setting its rate of growth for performance year two, which we are in now, which is 2019. And I want to say again, <laughs> Vermont's goals, we are certain, Vermont is certainly a leader. We have a statewide program. This program, in, and, and you'll hear more about that from the board and from One Care Vermont and from DIVA, the program is including providers across our state it's a statewide model, uh, and, and in that respect, we are certainly a leader in having an integrated system that's spanning provider and provider types throughout our whole state. But we're also 
in a model that's really consistent with the direction that the federal government has established, that direction being established with the Affordable Care Act, being reinforced by MACRA again. And then I think we were all wondering if that direction would change with the change of administration. And when it comes to value-based payment, that direction has not changed, and the current administration is continuing to push value-based payment and to um, assert that ACOs that take risk in, uh, uh, are, are achieving good results, whereas ACOs participating in shared savings programs were not as successful in achieving cost containment uh, results. So we see our federal partners continuing to move towards value-based payment. And I know that sounds like jargon, but our federal partners are continuing to say, fee-for-service is not where we want to be. So in 2017, uh, the Quality Payment Program was established, and that was something that came out of MACRA. So instead of providers ha being seeing their reimbursement rates um, updated through the sustainable growth rate formula, which was flawed and was not actually contributing to uh, rate changes, MACRA established what's called the Quality Payment Program. The Quality Payment Program has two tracks for providers to participate in. One is the Merit-Based Incentive Program, MIPS. The other track is Advanced Alternative Payment Models. Providers that participate in MIPS have to submit all of their quality information to Medicare, and then Medicare determines whether those providers get a rate increase or a rate decrease based on their performance. So there's a lot of reporting for those providers, and the, what, what the outcome of that is is uncertain if their rate increases or decreases. And as the program is fully implemented, those rate increases or decreases can swing 9% up, 9% down based on your performance. When you say the providers, who are you specifically talking about? Medicare enrolled providers for Parts A and B of Medicare. Medicare. Yes. And um, the advanced alternative payment model track allows for providers, <coughs> because they are participating in the value-based payment model, as long as they are participating in that value-based payment model and they're participating in their quality performance reporting in that model, those providers receive a 5% increase. So is that an incentive to participate? It, it's, it's the federal government's very strong, in my opinion, incentive to participate, yes. And so that's the history and context for the all-payer model. <laughs> <laughs> for, for now. Yeah. Well, I actually think that, I mean, it's, it seems there's a lot there, but I actually think it's, it's a little helpful to have a sense of where we were and how we got to where we are. And where we are is, let me see if I can just say, we're, we're so we've entered into the agreement, we've start, we've established an accountable care organization to implement the agreement with providers. We, we the state didn't establish it, but no. there is an accountable care organization and in yeah, the state. It came into yes. existence yes. to do that. Uh, and I think is it one of the significant things for me is to try, and, and there's lots to understand here, but that we are part way. We are just really in the beginning years of a longer, or what is set out to be a, what, a six, five or six year? It's a six year agreement with five performance years. Right, right. So it's, so as we learn and understand more about what's happening, for us to hold that in perspective as well, that we are, we are, We've entered into this agreement, we've started to implement the agreement, but we are not fully, I mean, we're in, there are stages to the, to the implementation, and we are in the relatively, not early stage, but we are in the 
earlier stages of implementation, which as a result of that, we are in both worlds at the same time. Yes. Which is part of the complexity yes. of where we are. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I think what I'd like to do at this point is, I mean, I know this is a lot, and, but to just kind of open it up for committee member questions about where we are, uh, any questions actually at this point. And then let me get a sense, Ina, are you, <coughs> so this gets us to this point and then have we be hearing from the Green yes. Care Board. So, so let's open up questions for Ina at this point. So, is that okay? Just to see where we're going. Right. I have one easy one, I think. Yeah. Can you give me an example of a Medicare provider? Yes. Um, or a couple of examples. A primary care provider is most, a, a provider does not have to enroll with Medicare, but many providers do enroll with Medicare because there are many Vermonters who are covered by the Medicare program. And so a primary care provider is probably a great example of, of someone who's likely to be enrolled with Medicare. Your doctor. Oh, and someone, someone who has Medicare as their primary source of health care insurance can go to that yes. practice and they and they will accept them. Yes. Because they can then because of their agreement they can bill Medicare on behalf of the patient. I think okay, good. That, that helps. largely most providers <coughs> in the state are likely uh, enrolled with Medicare. Mm -hmm. There are probably very few that are not. To Brian's question, just to clarify, how would you know if your provider is part of the ACA? <coughs> not only are they Medicare provider, but they, how would you know that they're yeah. actually part of the chemical care organization process of changing payment? I'm going to defer that answer to either One Care or the Green Mountain Care Board, which both have are are up to date with exactly how people are notified of uh, the <laughs> providers participating. I've seen a sign in my provider's office that it is signs. participating in the accountable care organization, but I don't, but I, I'm going to defer to those who have the right answer for you. Um, I was just wondering what other states have ACO systems? Do you know? There are many ACOs operating in the, in the United States. Many of those ACOs are maybe a, a one-payer ACO, so they're participating in the Medicare ACO program, or they're participating in a commercial ACO program, and or uh, Massachusetts has a very large Medicaid ACO program. There, I, I have fewer examples of ACOs that are all payer ACOs. But that's something that we can come, I can come back to you to try to give you that answer. That's part of the significance of this agreement is that it's all payer, and that's what I mean. You hear you hear that term, and it doesn't necessarily mean something unless you maybe make the distinction that you said that when you hear accountable care organization, it does not necessarily mean that that accountable care organization right. in another state or jurisdiction is trying to implement an all. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial That's right. together. That's right. Exactly. And if they are doing that, they do not have an agreement like the state of Vermont does that requires them to be, uh, to the alignment across those programs to be assessed. And that's, again, something we heard really clearly from providers is that alignment across payer programs and a majority of, of their patients being in the same type of payment model would be really helpful for them in changing how care is delivered and improving the delivery of care. So that's where Vermont is really consistent with the goals of the federal government, but we are a leader as well. The, the government's pushing this way and we're, we're going at a faster pace. Can you say what the alignment means? When you say to be in alignment across all the the three different 
types of payers? Mm -hmm. What does that actually look like? There's there there are a variety of 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 ways that we would assess that the Green Mountain Care Board was would assess alignment, and I think that they can talk to you about exactly what those ways are. But an example would be what the contract looks like in terms of the payment. Um, an example would be um, an example might be how beneficiaries are attributed to the ACO in each of those payer programs. That's a key area for alignment. My question, if, if I may, yeah. Uh, if, I'm not sure whether I should ask it now or wait until we've heard from the other, uh, other folks, but um, earlier you had a slide and then you alluded to it a couple times, I think, about target, reasonable targets. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how reasonable has been interpreted uh, up to this point anyway, just in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. percentages. The growth target that Vermont established for the all as the all-payer target is 3.5% um, at the end of the five performance years of the agreement. And we established that target because we wanted to to see the healthcare system growth moderate to something closer to the growth in the economy, but that is not that is that is still higher than the growth in the economy, and that's where that target came from. From excuse me, through an assessment of what the historical growth of the healthcare system had looked like eight, for 15 years, and at the same time, what economic growth had looked like for a 15 year span. That's where that, the Medicare target is one that the federal government really, really pushed Vermont hard on in that um, Vermont is a, is a very low cost state when we think about how uh, many dollars we spend on Medicare beneficiaries. However, the rate that we're increasing that amount of dollars is fast compared to other states, and that's where Medicare wanted Vermont to moder moderate. The f our federal partners felt that Vermont should um, grow in the Medicare program 0.2 percentage points below national projected Medicare growth. And that changes from year to year? Correct, yeah. So that actually leads well into my question, which was, are those, are the growth rates aligned in terms of um, <laughs> what the expectation is for um, commercial Medicaid and Medicare and whether they are or aren't, how does that play into the whole cost shift issue? Because Medicaid could keep its growth rate down by increasing the cost shift and then that would make the commercial pairs mm -hmm. more unable to keep that growth rate down. <laughs> That's what I alluded to when I talked about how Vermont's proposal had changed based on our year negotiation with the federal government and one of the things that I think came through in that negotiation which I think is a very positive change to our proposal and is something that we learned by working with our federal partners was for there to be an assessment of the payer differential for these per member per month payments, for these prospective payments. And that is something that the Green Mountain Care Board has to do, I believe, on an annual basis. And that is, it puts a spotlight on what those rates of growth are and how they differ by payer. So it's something that we need, that through this agreement we are able we will be looking at, and I. But but the fact that they may be different doesn't fully identify the degree to which uh, there might be an increase or reduction in cost shift because maybe Medicaid is being more efficient or mm -hmm. things like that, and and I know that the Green Man Care Board monitors the cost shift, but I'm wondering to what extent the all payer model itself um, has any focus on where those cost shifts could be resulting or 
it does moderating. It does have that focus in terms of asking that there be an uh, explanation for that differential between payers. And in explaining that differential, I think, and again, I'll let the Green Mountain Care Board speak to that. Um, that is uh, where we would look to see potential uh, recommendations for narrowing the payer differential. And it would explore underlying costs, and it's a very, I think it's a fairly complicated analysis of that payer differential. I have several comments and questions. Uh, first, um, just a comment, this all payer accountable uh, model that looks very streamlined, very beautiful, very simple, but surely there must be issues with it, okay? Um, <laughs> just a thought. <laughs> uh, no, no one's ever raised any. <laughs> um, and, and I understand trying to limit costs of growth and, and limit, limiting costs of health care, but by keeping these costs down, I, uh, I wonder, uh, by keeping the costs down, what, what actually is is being cut as far as the provider and the services that they provide to the patient. And then, and then finally, um, you, you mentioned quality, uh, quality measurements. You know, uh, uh, your providers are, are doing all these things, uh, uh, doing, well, I, first off, I'd like to know what these quality measurements are uh, that the provider has to, uh, mm -hmm. to look at. And I'm also thinking, you know, we're getting away from doing the basic work of a physician, which is to treat patients and not look at, and I know, I know, we have to look at the other side, but it just seems like we're getting away from medicine uh, and, and having to do um, quality measurements, which a physician shouldn't really be doing. That's my comment. One piece of the, I, um, one Care Vermont and the Green Mountain Care Board can both talk about, and as well as Diva can talk about the quality measures and what they are, and, and talk and explain that to you and the framework for quality measurement to you. I, when I talked about the local control that Vermont has relative to the Medicare program, one thing that I didn't mention that is very important is that, and this is a to Representative Donahue's. Uh, question. Another area very important uh, to alignment is are the quality measures aligned across the payer, participating payers to reduce the burden on providers and are providers looking at the same and make and s the same basic set of measures for their uh, patients and the local control that Vermont has allows Vermont to uh, propose changes to Medicare's set of measures so that Medicare's measures better match what we're measuring in Medicaid and the commercial programs. And that those measures also align with Vermont's specific priorities for improvement, which are to improve uh, our access to primary care providers, to reduce the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease in our state, and to reduce suicide and drug overdose in our state. And we reduce the Medicare set of measures, and I'll let the Green Mountain Care Board speak more to that and, and how, but we align those measures with our population health outcomes, and that measure set was reduced so that it was in better keeping with our objectives as a, as a state. Vermont has performs well in quality in some areas that many other states don't perform well in, and that's why Medicare as a program has this larger set of measures. So I think that's one thing that's very important about our flexibility with the agreement. Is are, 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 are our providers happy with this system that we currently have? Are there issues? I, I think that there are issues, and I think that there are also improvements that providers working in the system have already appreciated and have shared in a variety of ways. Um, there was a uh, Green Mountain Care Board meeting, and 
out again others did you attend that meeting so that's one one forum where providers were sharing about how they have changed care delivery in this model so what so I'm just going to pick up on one thing that Woody was asking which I think I understand accurately but Medicare, because it's the federal government paying for Medicare, absent our being part of an agreement like this, they actually have, the federal government has the authority and ability to impose whatever quality measures yes. they want. Yes, and, and is have, doing so through the doing MIPS, so. MIPS program that I talked yeah. about. Yeah, so that's, that's, that, that's that, that, that split that you're talking about. So, I mean, this is not to justify necessarily this avenue, but if we weren't absent an, an agreement that gives Vermont more flexibility to try to shape Medicare's requirements, because it's federal government and it's federal money, they, they have a set of, in, in this case, quality measures which we would be required to meet uh, regardless of what we thought Yes. We thought they were good, bad, or indifferent. That's right. So that's that's one piece of it. Um, and I would just I would just say because I think we're I, I think it's great. I think all these questions need to get asked. Uh, <coughs> we're trying to. I mean, some of the questions really are going to need to be directed to One Care and to hearing from other folks about uh, One Care. And so we're just going to, it's going to be an ongoing process of, of without, we, we've got to hear from numbers of people. And that's, we kind of deferred this piece till after crossover, but there's a lot, there's a lot here to understand it. And to, you know, maybe raise questions about it. Other questions for, one, and I want to just actually name the other question that you, I've just kind of, put a mark on the question you asked is like well, what is being cut what is it is that is one of the fundamental questions that has been asked and needs to be asked over and over and over again are we simply going to achieve the targets by doing less is somebody going to get fewer services are they going to get inadequate services uh, and therefore and, and when it's measured we'll go oh we met our target but in fact people were getting not what they needed, but less than they needed, and less than they would have gotten before. And I think that's one of the that's one of the the ongoing drum beats that has to be asked over and over throughout this whole process. It has been. I mean, this is you know it, it, it's the question that always rises immediately as we talk about this, and it, and it needs to be talked about, thought about regularly. It, it's not something that just can get answered once and be done. I, I, you're, yep. you're naming something that has been asked before and will need to be continue to be asked. Yeah. And the other drumbeat, which may not be for you right now, maybe other players, but um, some of us are aware that mental health and substance use are not fully integrated into the all air model, which is needs to keep being asked about. Yes. That movement yes. and the fact that that does not meet our principles of Vermont healthcare. So there's lots of lots of pieces in the picture. Mark? Um, just a couple comments. I would uh, echo or an area of concern I have about um, how we how we move forward with the value based and I'm, I've been a supporter of this process um, while we were working towards Act 48. Um, so I felt along with Helen Ramsey and um, everyone that was really rallying to get this done. I, I appreciate it. Um, and as someone who works in the healthcare system, one of the concerns that I do have are, and I know we're working on it, is those um, quality measures and if readmission rates are part of them, are we seeing sometimes um, early discharges that will lead to higher read readmission rates? Mm -hmm. um, but I think built into the, the system is the um, 
think we are discharging people too early, too soon, um, it's going to come back to bite us yes. because they're going to be likely readmitted sooner. Yes. Uh, and the other one is patient satisfaction scores. I think those are really hard. Um, there's a lot of subjectivity um, in you, and so I think those are. I'll just throw that out there. I think patient satisfaction scores are really hard to use as a quality measure. And the last thing is what I think that um, alignment along um, IT and um, medical record are really key in being able to have um, standardized quality measures for all the providers. Um, so I think that's a, an exciting part of Not too surprisingly, I think we, we all say I, <laughs> only uh, those of us who are planning our agenda may have bitten off more than we could chew this morning uh, in the time that we've allowed, but I think, uh, I think this is a piece of kind of laying the foundation for the next pieces, and I'm, I'm thinking we had, we, had, um, we had scheduled this to go to 11, and uh, I, think, I think we have some I'm not sure what your availability is to go it's a little bit past 11 or some past 11, and I, and I know some others. Uh, Alicia, we may, may have to invite you back. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and I think uh, Sarah Squirrel was scheduled to be presenting us something at 11 15, but I think we're going to see if we can be in touch and have. Push that back a little bit. Let 11:45 would probably. Yeah, because there's it's it's a, it's a more. She needs a brief update. It's, it's a brief update for us. Um, could we um, agree to go till 11:30 on uh, Susan Barrett? I'm looking to you and Michael. Michael. Yeah. Uh, so then, given that, uh, I'm going to suggest we take a quick stretch yes. between. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to check this out, guys. Like, how to, how to, how to fix it. So let's take a quick stretch and then come back and we'll hear from Susan Barron. I think we're going to need to turn to Alicia at another point in time. Uh, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll communicate with Sarah Squirrel during the break. We, we are going to do our best to have attention for this presentation. There are folks who are going to be coming and going from our committee. Apologies for those other things that are pulling people's attention as well. Um, but what I'd like to do is to turn this over to uh, the Green Mountain Care Board to help us understand uh, more from the Green Mountain Care Board's work about the uh, health care. Uh, turn it over to Susan and we can introduce her. Thank you. I'm Susan Barrett. I'm the Executive Director of the Green Mountain Care Board. And up front, I want to excuse my raspy voice, like everyone in this building, I'm getting over a cold. Um, I'm joined here today by Mike Barber. Mike Barber is our general counsel and has been our general counsel for three weeks. <laughs> but it's important for the committee to know that previous to being the general counsel, Mike was in the role that of the chief, as chief of health policy, the role that Ina vacated when she went over to the agency. So that's actually good context. Yeah. Um, I also want to introduce Melissa Miles, who's one of the project directors for the Green Mountain Care Board and works very closely with uh, the all pair model and the ACO regulation. So, um, Mr. Chair, where would what would you like me to do? Would you like us to go through the slides or address some of the questions? What is your pleasure? Okay, I could start with the slides. Some of them may end up being opportunities to integrate yeah. the question as you. Yeah. Because, because I, did, I would like you, you maybe just start to go through them. Maybe what we'll given that we only have we have till 11:30. This is more than. But uh, I think maybe it makes sense to put the questions along the way so that people are not like waiting because we're not going to have it. So we'll, we'll ask you if you can take questions as you present. Um, and, and we will come back to this as necessary because we're going to get more to understand and then we'll get the time to cover. Excellent. And, and I'll 
also say that we will make sure that we are in the room as you hear more testimony from our partners at DIVA as well as the ACO. I think it's really valuable for all of us to be in the room together, so we will commit to that. Great. Um, so, high level overview and goals for us today. Um, number one, to answer your questions, um, to provide a reminder of the all peer model goals very quickly, which uh, Ina highlighted. I want to talk, um, I think it's important for us to talk about the Green Mountain Care Board responsibilities in the model and um, dig deeper um, than what Ina touched on. Um, and then to give you a status update on the model and the role of the board in the oversight of the ACO, as well as the, uh, our work in the implementation of the all pair model. Um, Ina went over this, but it's, a, it's an, another way to hear it and to look at the goals of the accountable, all pair accountable care organization model. We are, as a state, testing payment changes, so we're looking at the payments, um, testing them in a population-based payments that are tied to the quality metrics. Uh, we are increasing investment in primary care as a goal of the model, and um, also monitored closely by the all pair, uh, by the board as we look at the ACO budget. We're looking to transform care delivery and Ina touched on that as well, but really focusing on care coordination. Um, I'll just address uh, the, the, what is, the question, what isn't being done? I, I, I kind of went to that in my mind, like what Kennedy said, what, what, what can you, I, I'm gonna get the quote wrong, but what, um, what don't do ask what you can do. Not, yeah, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you for the quote. But that, I went yeah, to the opposite side of that question of, what is being done and what is being looked at in terms of care coordination with providers, what is being done upstream to prevent illness is, is something that I think you hear more from the um, ACO and some of their providers. And then um, incorporating social determinants of health, which is a key part of this model. And then uh, the, also the goal of to improve outcomes, and, and we touched on these, the high level goals, in, these are in the agreement. The state has agreed to improve access to primary care, to reduce deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and to reduce the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. These again are the very high level goals, and then the quality metrics are filtered down through the ACO and then down to the providers. A provider does not individually, is not being held to reducing deaths due to suicide and drug overdose. That's a very big distinction that I think I should make. Can I just ask about the, the way we characterize it? Test, testing and payment changes? Yes. So just right over there on the left. Um, in the previous testimony, we heard that you know, as far back as maybe five years ago, there were pilot programs going on. Uh, so. so is, is the current agreement that we have, uh, I mean, is it described officially as a test? And, and does that mean as far as that there may be tweaks and changes over the course of the five years? It's not, and or six -year I, my, my colleague Mike will correct me if I say this wrong, I, and Ina may too, but it does not say test in the agreement at all. I don't believe it does. But Vermont is a, a very small state, and the ability for us to, I think Ina touched, touched on this as well, we are far ahead in payment reform, healthcare payment reform efforts, and the ability for providers to come together voluntarily to work on new ways of paying for healthcare is perhaps. Um, easier to do in a smaller state like Vermont than it would be in California. So I don't know if I answered your question, but it is is—it is not um, officially in the agreement called a, a test, but we are, we are looking at these models and the success of the agreement 
um, with the federal government and, and going forward into other agreements. If if this does not work, then that that is information that you can use going forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Great along, question. along that line, I mean, I just, uh, Governor, um, the governor was on the, you, know, you can quote me, or one of the television mm -hmm. programs just, just in the last few days, and he referred to it as a pilot, uh, again, and I think that that's sometimes confusing for people, and, you know, I, I'm, just to understand that this, this is, this is, as you described it, it's, it's, an, it's an effort to try to understand what can be achieved and to work toward achieving it. Uh, but it's not technically a pilot either. Correct. So I understand that. According to the agreement, it does not say test or not, but that's correct. Yeah. But that's, some people yeah, understand it as. What did you say? Is it may say in the lead-in language. Okay. The testing. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, <coughs> so, I, I believe we talked about this, Mike, I don't know if you want to yeah, touch I'll on this. Yeah, cover the slide. So this slide is, um, Nina talked about the, the general um, goals of the agreement, the targets of the agreement, and this slide is just trying to represent that. Um, obviously, we're, as a state, uh, as Nina said, this is an agreement between the state of Vermont and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, the, the goals of that agreement are um, reducing the growth of uh, healthcare spending or cost, uh, increasing uh, population health goals and improving quality, and then um, increasing alignment or ensuring the alignment of ACO programs operating in Vermont and increasing scale or the number of people who are, um, and providers who are part of this model. And um, I guess you can read the, the slide, but the point I wanted to make here is that, the, and I think Ina touched on this, is that the, the goals around alignment and scale are really intending to ensure that providers have consistent, strong incentives to do the cost containment and population health um, investments and efforts. So really, these these two are kind of boxes are intertwined. So it's very important um, that we increase scale, achieve alignment to um, to get to the cost containment growth and the population health goals of the agreement. Can you talk about the scale, the scale goals? Yes. Uh, we have a slide for that. We have a slide for that. So we do not have to report uh, to the federal government on our scale performance for 2018 performance year one until June of this year, and then we'll be reporting on performance year two, so 2019, in June of 2020. But we have uh, a good idea of where we were last year and where we expect to be for this year in terms of scale. <coughs> essentially, we are behind uh, where the agreement says we should be, but we are on the right trajectory. So the increase in scale from performance year one to performance year two is in line with the expectations in the agreement, but we started from a point that was too low. <coughs> and um, and so we're gonna have to, that's, that's one of the things that I think the ACO is very focused on, that's one of the things that we are focused on, uh, I think AHS is focused on is increasing scale, getting more payers and providers into this voluntary model. I know you're just scaling up and it's just way too early for any of this, but are you seeing any results where it's around state, even though the state is small as you're scaling up, The uh, any results where um, it's harder to Im implement in yeah. some areas and what the outcomes may be? Um, I would say, no, I just moved it to this picture, just so you know. I mean, each uh, community has its own unique challenges. Uh, so, for example, my understanding in the Rutland area, there was an issue about um, the hospital not having primary care practices, all the primary <laughs> care practices being at the FQHC, and, 
and the hospital accepting risk, but really not getting the benefit of some of um, being in the ACO. Other other areas, you know, the hospitals um, looking at, at at the risk for for these programs in terms of you know, their budget and their specific circumstances, and specifically the Medicare risk, which is quite large compared to the other payers. So, I mean, each, I think we've heard stories about challenges in a lot of different communities, and it's kind of uh, each community specific circumstances. Uh, but this uh, slide is showing kind of the geographic growth of the program from performance year zero in 2017, whereas you mentioned Medicaid went first with the risk-based program to 2018 and then 2019, where, where only two communities are uh, not in for at least one program. And I'll add with those two communities, one is um, the, the Copley area, and it's the same situation that Mike was describing in Rutland, where the hospital does not have any of the primary care. That's all at the FQHC in that area. Um, and then the other area is um, Grace Cottage area, which is um, a very small hospital, um, more, uh, you know, very hard for them to, to take on any risk. So that's, I think, a good point of some of the challenges different areas are facing. So can you go back to the scale and just kind sure. of talk, make, kind of give us a sense of the, um, I mean, so you can, Mike, you mentioned that, I'm not sure if the numbers in front of us show us where we are or these are the goals. Uh, both. So, okay. um, to see where we're we're at. There's, so there's two <coughs> targets for each year. There's a Medicare target and an all payer target. So the Medicare target for yeah. performance year one, 2018, was 60% uh, in our performance we think preliminarily was 35%. For the all-payer target, uh, it was 36%. Our performance was 20%. For performance year two, the Medicare target was 75. We're at 51, we believe. Uh, all-payer target is 50. We believe we're uh, between 30 and 40, depending on what happens with some contracts that one care is working on now. So, um, I, mean, I think the takeaway is we're not where the agreement says we should be, but we've done a lot of work and we're on a good trajectory um, and kind of in line with what the agreement uh, expectations were. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned, I guess it was Copley, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe some other hospitals having difficulty getting primary care providers uh, for those facilities. What if they just can't get the manpower? No, it, let me clarify. So that in the Copley area, as well as the Rutland, area, in the Rutland um, Health Service area, the primary care providers are exclusively part of the FQHC, and they're not part of the hospital. And the way that um, folks are what we call attributed to the model, they are attributed through their primary care provider. So if the hospital does not quote unquote own any primary care providers, they cannot participate in the model. They have to partner with their FQHC. But the hospitals are the ones who are, are participating with the risk. Is, is that a good thing? It is a, um, it is a result of um, historical changes in the way um, primary care was owned going back to the 90s. I know that Rutland um, Hospital used to have a lot of the primary care, and they they migrated over to the FQHC. It might have not have been the 90s, pre previous years. Um, it is just the way some communities are set up that way, just based on historical migration of practice. And they don't change? Oh, they can still participate. Okay. Uh, the community can participate as a whole. It's just, it's easier for communities who, uh, hospitals who actually um, have primary care in the hospital, UVMMC is a perfect example. They have their own, uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a few primary care providers that are 
owned by the hospital, employed by the hospital. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Okay. No. Right. No, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Copley sitting in the middle of this this area that's still kind of light green. Why do they even need to think about participation? I mean, it, it doesn't seem to make any sense to me, probably because I don't know. Uh, why even bother with this? Well, so far they haven't. <laughs> they haven't bothered. Oh, yeah, what's their advantage when they do? What's their advantage? What's, yeah. the, what's the incentive for them to decide yeah. to participate? What, um, what would be of value to them? I wouldn't invite you to ask that to one care when they come yeah. on Tuesday, but um, I think the advantage is the potential for savings if you perform better than expectations, right? That's kind of um, the model that we have is that we have targets for the ACO based on here's what we think spending will be in the upcoming year, and if if you, the ACO, beat that target, you get savings. Uh, those savings, in large part, go to the hospitals that are on the flip side taking the risk. So, so what you're saying is, if someone elects to go to Copley Hospital, they can go to Newport and save money. That's what it sounded like. No, said. so it's it's. We're talking about at the provider level. We're not talking at the patient level. And I, I think I, I think another addition to what Mike has shared in terms of um, and the ACO, I look at them as well, can address this as well. And it, and it relates to scale. This model and the 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 support that the providers can get from the ACO and care coordination and population health in um, education around, um, you, you know, it's their, their way of providing that coordinated care in order to, to, at the end of the day, to provide savings to the system in the whole will be the incentive for places like Copley in that community to participate in the model. And it has to be, this is, this is a big scale question. It goes beyond the, Providers, it, go, it goes to self-insured plans, and, and I'll get. I have another slide that I, I want to make sure we get to in terms of the role of the board. But we need to look at, you know, what are folks paying for health insurance, and if there's a business in the state who wants to part, you know, who, who says, <laughs> okay, the the working within the model, our insurance premiums are predictable and affordable. That's an incentive to join the model, and, I, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but these are, it's the bigger picture um, that I think folks need to understand. And it, it'll get there, I think you need to hear from the ACO as well. Yeah, that's, I think we're really trying to have yeah. put all these pieces together, but it's, uh, in the meantime, Woody and then Amory. Uh, you talked about risk. Uh, it seems to me that uh, a hospital, um, if it takes risk in providing, I don't know, additional services that are not provided elsewhere, that they have a great opportunity of, um, you know, being profitable. I know they're, you know, nonprofit, but um, it seems to me uh, those risks might be beneficial to certain to certain hospitals in finding uh, a, a niche in, in the work that they're that they're doing. <coughs> Just an observation. I, I would say more aligned to the incentives of population health, and and yes, they are they are taking on the risk of a, that population in their. And, and I'm health. sure they don't take it lightly as well. Absolutely. Um, but you know there are, there are benefits to uh, um, to doing that risk uh, in whatever area that they're going. Potentially, but that's the point of the risk. There's that. That Ian you know, talked about that two-sided risk in the, in the past. There was only upside risk. Now there's two-sided risk. So the incentive again is to get ahead of um, health issues that could impact um, the cost of care of the patient, and as well as keeping that community healthy. Let's keep trying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. Get, we'll yeah. To what we can get to. Yeah. The Copley Grace Cottage are the only two there. Yeah. And we're talking about incentives for them to, but the other side is 
will they eventually be squeezed to participate? This is a voluntary program. I know it's voluntary, but will market forces and stuff like that squeeze them? So I, I think Ina had, had um, talked about kind of the, the push at the federal level to go towards value-based payments, of which this is one model. So I think, but yes, we'll provide a care. Exactly. Yes, I mean, providers are being pushed towards value-based payment across the board. And this is one option that providers have to join this model and get support and resources um, and help managing their population from an ACO. Um, so I think, in part, yes, probably providers are being squeezed, but um, but in, in a broader push towards value-based payments at the national and state level. Mm -hmm. the, the, this is happening at the federal level. It has been happening. Um, I think the point Ina made about the transition to the new administration, one of the biggest surprises I had was the continuation of the value-based focus. That's a great question. So um, this is a map just of the hospitals in the state and which ones are participating. Mm -hmm. And so back to the previous slide then that had the scale numbers. This is a, a these, these numbers represent a larger pool of some sort of providers beyond hospitals. Uh, but can you define what that pool looks like and is it we can, and one of the slides is... Um, Maybe we jumped over it. Yeah. No, 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 I just wanted to point out that there's a, a fairly detailed specification yeah. of that we, that we have yeah. developed yeah. and yeah. confirmed with the federal government about what populations are in, what populations are out, but essentially, Medicare scale targets, we're talking about all Medicare beneficiaries. For the all-payer scale target, we're talking, <coughs> target, we're talking about most Vermonters, including the Medicare mm -hmm. beneficiaries. So th this is there are certain groups that are excluded, like um, I think people in Tricare and federal programs, uh, the uninsured, obviously not in here. But for the most, it's most for them. So this is okay. Th this is not providers then. These, these, these are for these are these are these people. are people. people patients. Yeah, patients. And the other map was providers and participants. Okay. So that's a very good distinction. Vermont residents. Yes. Thank you. And then j just because I was a little confused, but maybe. Maybe we've seen it before. You're differentiating between Medicare and all payer here. So all payer is not really all payer. If you think of Medicare as the payer, it's all except technically not. Well, Medicare is included. I think yeah. when they, yeah. they use the term, I think yeah. when, they use, when they use the term all payer on this slide, that includes Medicare. Yeah. It does it targets include. exactly. Okay. So you're, you're, you're breaking it out. But all payers still includes Medicare and those yes. numbers. Yeah. And, and there are, um, on scale, on quality, on cost, there are separate targets for Medicare and, and like other payers because Medicare was keen on us, uh, well, at least on the cost side, obviously demonstrating savings to the Medicare program and value to, to them. And it, can I go to one other slide before so we can get this in today? Because um, I'm, um, this was the, I just told Mike, this is my favorite new slide. Um, because I, I, one of the things I wanted to make sure, one of the goals that I had for, for what I wanted to share with you today is the distinct role the board plays in the all pair model. And um, one of the questions somebody had earlier was, um, what other states are participating? I think it was ACOs. You you had asked about ACOs, but it's, it's someone else in the room can correct me if I'm wrong. There's only one other state that participates in an all payer model with the federal government at this time, and that's Maryland. They participated for many years, but they have a newer agreement that um, was negotiated around the same time as ours, a little bit before. But the the distinction that I want to point out to all of you is that while negotiating with the federal government, um, the role, the, the existence of the Green Mountain Care Board and the, the regulatory structure that 
the legislature had created within the state was one of the key reasons that the agreement was able to go forward. Maryland also has a similar type of a board. It's much larger, um, but it is an in, it, it's also a, a board that has regulatory levers that can support the success of the model. So I just wanted to make that clear to everyone. And when you look at the two goals that the, that the board has and the mission of the board, which is to reduce the rate of growth in healthcare expenditures, as well as to ensure access to high quality care, these levers, with the Medicare ACO program design and rate setting, which is part of the all-payer model, the ACO budget review, which you gave to us as part of Act 113, 2016, as well as the certification of the ACO, and then these other levers that we've had um, in our purview, hospital budget review, health insurance rate review, and certificate of need, all of those combined are, are, are really a, um, a quite a benefit to the success of this model and to the to the support of the success of the model. So I just wanted to make sure I got that out. It's a, a bit of a plug, but um, shamelessly playing the board. So um, I think we should go back to some of these, the beginning, um, some of the reporting we do. Does that work? Yeah, I think, I part think of that's this really a, important. A status to update, hear. Make an update. Um, you all on where um, where we're at. Um, so as Ina mentioned, I think um, the board <coughs> is uh, responsible under the agreement for developing the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative, which is basically the ACO program that the federal government offers uh, through the agreement. And we kind of do two things there. We, we set the Medicare benchmark or the financial target that's part of that program for any ACOs that want to participate in that program. Um, and we do that annually. Uh, we have um, some parameters in the agreement as, in terms of where we can set that target. Um, and it has, to be, it has to be approved by CMS. So we've worked closely uh, and have for the past two years with CMS on, on the benchmarking methodology that's developed um, and have established. What well, is that really be? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, sounds that, like, it, sounds like, it sounds like a lot of uh, jargon. jargon. Yes. To be honest, what, what does it really mean? <laughs> Well, no, I'm serious. I, I don't mean to be part? critical, but it's just like, the, like, the what, like what is, set, what is setting, setting an annual Medicare benchmark? It's a, so, so or um, why, why is it it's valuable? Or? Setting a, a target um, for the ACO to meet, a, a spending target. Uh, this is, we have a certain group of people who are aligned to the ACO, and the ACO is responsible for the spending and quality of that group of people. These are the attributed exactly. lives. The the attributed lives. lives that are attributed to the ACO for that and care. care. Exactly. And you are said you as one of your responsibilities is to set a goal, if you will, or, yes. or a, a, a ceiling as to what they're not supposed to exceed in terms of increased expenditure on an annual basis. Yes. I don't know if I'm getting it right. No, you are. That's um, exactly so it. So there's a certain set of services that the ACO is responsible for. A certain group of people the ACO is responsible for the attributed lives, um, and then the benchmarking, or I think it's easier to think of it as a financial target, because <coughs> we're we're setting a target for the spending for those services on those lives in the upcoming year performance period, um, and it's very complicated, but essentially it's taking a base claims experience. <coughs> projecting that forward to the performance period. And, and that's that's the ACO's target. And then as part of the two-sided risk, this these are this is a two-sided risk model. So the ACO is at risk if it spends over that target. And if it spends under, there's some savings. Obviously quality is incorporated into that. So its performance on quality measures impacts how it does financially. But that's the general just as if you go over the target, 
you're going to have to pay some money back to Medicare or, or another payer if you, if you achieve savings over what was projected to be the spending, then you get some money back. <laughs> and, I th and I think the key, one of the key pieces here is that it's not like the ACO is, it's, this is not like, uh, so where do those savings go if there's, if the savings, so I think that's important yeah, to, to that talk is. about. What happens with the savings if there are savings? Um, if there are savings, then first they will go to the hospitals um, because they are the ones under this model that are taking all the risk. So um, there's a distribution formula. There's three steps. There's a policy on our website, One Care's distribution policy, but essentially it's first to the hospitals for the risk they're taking. Uh, hospitals are also contributing a lot of money towards these programs, population health programs, so the money that's going out to primary care, the money that's going out to community providers. If there's savings, the hospitals get reimbursed for that. And then if there's any excess savings beyond that, there's a formula that's basically the same as uh, money that's paid out under One Care's um, quality withhold program. So that's 70% of primary care. It goes, it goes to the providers. providers. Yes. Sorry. Easy answer is it goes to the providers. <laughs> it all goes, I think that's, at the end of the day, it all goes back to the providers, well, whether it's a hospital or a provider level. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's what's provider important provider to level. understand that it, it's not like it goes into a savings account at ECO. No. no. That's one care. There's a misunderstanding. Thank you for, yeah. the Thank you for bringing that up. That's really important. Yeah. Okay. I think Dave's question. So we'll I have one. I'm wondering about the scenario where rather than savings, there's turns out that there's more spent. And so I've heard, I've heard you say two-sided risk, and I think maybe we heard that earlier too. Mm -hmm. So does two-sided risk mean, I, I think I understand now, but uh, does it mean that there are two different parties sharing the risk, or is all the risk on the providers here? And and if, if that's the case, if they do spend, end up spending more than they were you know, than the target, are they eating all of that cost? Are they really bearing all the risk, I guess, is another way to uh, So it is shared risk. It's not. It's not it is shared risk. Okay. They are not bearing all the risk. Uh, so there is, in all of these programs that we've seen so far, there is a cap on overages. So the, the ACO would only have to pay up to a certain percentage of the target. So for Medicare this year, it's 5% over the target. Um, if if they blow their target by more than 5%, then that is eaten by the federal government. So it's a, it's a, sh a sharing of risk, but it's limited. It's not, uh, it's not like an insurance company. It's just totally at, at risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, I, I know this is it's great we're getting this out here the first time because I think the ACO can really convey these steps at, at their level, and I think that's a, that's really important questions for them as well. But it's great to hear it no, from it's us too. One care to be in the room hearing yeah. what these questions are, so that yeah. when we hear from one care. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying yeah. that's why it's important, yeah, so, so that we're actually able to ask some of the same questions and have it understood. Lucy, uh, so yeah, I think I'll save my question for okay. one care actually. Okay. Uh, my question is sort of more holistic. We talk about how um, we're doing all this and we're saving money, we're trying to do this, and we often hear how Vermont's health insurance rates, their, their costs are, you know, lower than other states. Under this, I know it's early, but how is Vermont doing compared to the scheme of the rest of the country? Just in general, I'm sure like, we don't need to. But you know, what do you? In because what people, area? people are saying they can't afford health insurance. Mm -hmm. They can't afford um, if they do have health insurance to mm -hmm. to um, participate. But yet we hear from months, oh, rates are much lower than the rest of the country. Is it just that everybody always complains about taxes and health care costs, or is it? Is there some substance to that complaint so in I, Vermont? So I think we go all the way back to what Ina started with and how we got here. And I wrote down a couple of things when you asked, I think it was the chair who asked what brought us here. And 
Yes, Vermont is a lower cost state when it comes to Medicare per member per year, but it is still too expensive, and that is how we got here. Oh, and yeah. excuse me, and was growing, growing faster. Um, so there is still work to do, and and this. Um, model attempts to get to that underlying cost of care. And we're year two in the model. Um, I think personally, in order to see success, it, we need to see that scale, those scale targets increase so that we can literally scale this model. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but it's a tough question to answer. So, so let me just, we're going to need to stop for today. Yeah, and I know that fine. we haven't gotten to cover everything that you prepared for us. And thank you for indulging her. I think it was <laughs> useful for us to be able to ask questions along the way. Um, I think, is it, I'm just going to offer a couple thoughts and that maybe one care can help respond to and then you have in future days. Like, um, I mean, it's a little bit like we're in a catch-22 of sorts. And it seems to me that we're not at scale, and we're not, and we're, and scale the scale is to be achieved over time in any case. But we're not quite at the level of scale we'd like. And until we get to scale, it's hard to actually see the full benefits and experience the full benefits of the alignment, so that the providers are only dealing with. Uh, I mean, they're not having to deal with like differences from commercial, from Medicaid, from Medicare. So we're we're in probably the most difficult. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that we're, in some ways, we're, we're neither here nor there. Uh, and so in some ways, we're kind of like in the most difficult point in time uh, of, of a change like this. Because the providers can't fully experience the benefits, if there are going to be benefits. And yet, we're asking, actually, people to participate in multiple ways, even though the goal is to not have that be the case. And we're asking for more people to participate based on our hopes that it's going to be better and some of what has been experienced so far, but we're not far enough along to actually prove it all. It's like it just seems like a conundrum. Uh, of, 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 I mean, that's where, that's how I'm perceiving it right now. And and I just I don't know what else to say other than that. And and that this is a complex process of trying to achieve some major structural changes within healthcare that I think the goals, many people, maybe not everybody, but many people share the goals. The question is, is this, is this level of complexity and expense worth achieving the goals that have been set out? Or are we, you know, and, and so I think that's, that's kind of like, those have to be some of the questions that people are asking along the way. People around this table, but also people and people participating. So those are the things we have to grapple with. And can I just say one thing? Please. And I think yeah. we should hear from the ACO and they come out for now, yeah. which I really pleasure. Um, I'm a glass half full person. We, uh, there are challenges, and this is a ton of work but it is extraordinary, he has to go, how much progress <laughs> to go um, we have made in our attempt. I, I actually, this graph is one of my other favorite graphs. I mean, this is from the first year of the model to today. There, there has been significant uptick in participation, and it has been gradual, which in, in, we have heard um, from the, our federal partners that that may be a benefit as well because in other states where different programs were um, uh, initiated, if things went too quickly, that there's a risk there as well. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm being, um, I'm trying to not be too rosy, but I do think that this. I, this is very impressive what the providers have done to date. But I, I do liken our, um, where we are right now to kind of like adolescence, you know, like a tween age, where it's, 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 a, it's growing. And we're at a, 
at a changing point in, in, our, in our model. And I, I'm looking forward to us hearing from One Care. I've, I've had the opportunity to sit down with One Care uh, <coughs> apart from the committee, and I think there's pieces that it's useful for us to hear about what is actually happening on the ground with some providers and what One Care has been able to what One Care is able to bring to the actual patient experience and provider experience, and that's we're all talking very theoretically here, and I think that's really contributes to the complexity. Of the, the difficulty of understanding why would we be doing this and why are we doing this and what is what's the value here. Um, and and but, I just yeah I, I, I appreciate just, that it's you know like yeah and I think these are great questions and from my perspective at the board we we want to answer all of your questions. It's really hard because it's so complex. It makes my brain hurt a lot. So um, I think the more we can have these conversations and answer your questions um, is, is positive for, right. for all of us. Yeah, I think it's actually essential for us. Yeah. Um, and so with that, I think we're going to stop for this morning. Uh, I want to express my appreciation, Susan, yeah. to you and to Ian, who I think I believe, and to Mike, who I believe. Um, and to the committee, I'll just say, uh, I kind of, I'm not trying to sell this, but I'm just saying kind of hang in there because I think there's more pieces to hear and the questions are actually important. I'm not, these, the questions that are being raised are, are the same, in many ways the same, but uh, also important questions. I'm not like, I don't mean that in a dismissive. These are the questions that need to get asked uh, as we, because we are in the midst of this right now. And then policy questions come up for us as a committee and the legislature is like, where are we? Do we continue? Uh, what kind of what kind of oversight should there be? Is there enough oversight? Is there too much oversight? Is there this and that? So those, but in order to answer the policy questions that emerge, we need to actually understand this more fully. And it's a choppy way to do it. We're trying our best to try to now layer in a whole new set of information. Uh, and there are plenty of questions. And, and it's not like it's a smooth, just completely a smooth ride. So I'm going to suggest we stop there for now. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from One Care on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, and maybe we can have some conversation ahead of time as to how that how we can best set that up for the committee uh, to be learning about what One Care is is actually doing. Okay. So for the committee, we're going to stop here on this. Uh, I'm looking for. Can we just stay put for a minute? I'm looking for Ian Donahue, who I think was arranging for Commissioner Squirrel to communicate with us by phone rather than in person to give us a brief update on another, a small piece around children's inpatient <laughs> access. If your brain hasn't exploded on you this morning. As I said to somebody, I've said it so many times, but if you hear from this. We, we don't, as you've noticed, we don't pursue one issue in a linear way until it comes to completion is not possible and that is part of what's difficult about our work as a legislature. It's not unique to this committee, in case you're wondering, it's happening in every committee in the building. Uh, but we just kind of have to keep shifting gears. And I'm starting to think that we're knowledgeable a lot. You could, you know, after this, I'll just <laughs>